welcome to my next tutorial. Uh, in this tutorial, we're going to be covering full live performance using just Logic Pro 10. Now, if you're just interested in how to get this going and you immediately want to skip to setup, go ahead and click here and it will take you to the section of the video where we start actually covering how to do this. If you're not sure why you would want to use Logic over MainStage, for example, then I'm going to provide some background information and a few considerations uh, as to whether or not this is a good technique for you. Since I showed you in the last tutorial how to automate MainStage with Logic, and now I'm showing you just Logic, you may be wondering, well, how do I know which one to use? I would say that it depends on a few factors. The first being the speed of your machine. So when I was setting up that initial project using MainStage, I was doing it here on my iMac, which is a very spec'd out quad core machine, and it handled it with no issues whatsoever. I transferred the project over to my laptop, which is the machine that I actually perform live with. Took it out for a few gigs, and while it worked, I experienced some kind of uncomfortable glitches during the show. At the end of one gig, it actually had a catastrophic crash where I had to recover on the spot and go hardware only. So that caused me to rethink the method that I was using for the MacBook Pro, which is a more modest machine. It was only dual core, it's about six years old. And I don't take my iMac to live gigs. The other thing to consider, I think, would be your uh, familiarity and comfort with MIDI routing and Logic's environment. So if you're still pretty new to uh, MIDI and program chains messages, control chains messages and things like that, uh, and you want the more like visual interface, MainStage is really good about um, making it simple and easy to get going straight away. So if those things, if you're not comfortable with those or they're kind of intimidating or haven't learned enough about them, then perhaps MainStage should still be a good choice for now. Uh, if you're comfortable with MIDI and you're comfortable in Logic's environment window, then I think this is the most powerful method. It does take a little bit of legwork initially, but you can save it as a template and from there it becomes an extremely powerful way to perform live. So let's dive in. First of all, if you're enjoying these tutorials, please hit the subscribe button up top. I'm constantly releasing tu both tutorials and music videos, and I would love to have you stay up to date. If you really like them and you feel so inclined, I'm also on Patreon, and I would appreciate your support greatly. These videos will still be free and available on YouTube if you don't want to do that, but if you do, I do this full time and I love it. Thanks for watching and for heading over and checking it out. The first thing that I like to do is actually make a list. Uh, up here in the list editor under Project Notepad, I like to make a list of all the requirements that I want to have in the project. And it's convenient to have it here right within the project notes, that way I can be checking up on myself as I'm uh, implementing all of the features to make sure that I'm getting it right. Uh, so you can pause the video here and take a look through these, but we're going to be doing them as we go along. So I'm in a new Logic project. I have saved the project uh, not as a template, just as a regular project file. This allows me to do all the edits that I want to do and have a platform by which to save it, and then once it's all ready to go and complete, then I will come over here and save as template that I can use for later. So I'm assuming that you're already comfortable with the basics of Logic, so I'm only going to review things that I think are important. So you'll see here I've got several tracks already created. So there's a few issues that we need to address. Um, so I'm going to actually start down here with these three. These are our live uh, audio tracks, so actual physical audio inputs that we're using. Now, I don't want to have to come in here every time and you know click and highlight and then input monitor just to make sure that these are armed so that we can use them live. So the first thing to kind of get you closer to main stages always armed mode is to create a track stack out of your audio tracks. And we're going to pick summing stack and the reason why is because it actually sends to a bus. So you'll notice it's got these tracks now outputting down here. I've got it labeled as delay but it's going to bus 2. So all three of these tracks are going to bus 2 and we'll call this live instruments. Okay, so what does this do? Well, now I have a single input monitor that I can click that arms all of those tracks. So this is right there, ready to go at the beginning of the set. Of course, make sure that software monitoring is enabled so that these will actually sound appropriate. Now for the live tracks, of course, we have in-ear monitor mixes that we want to be completely separate, uh, well, sort of, sometimes we want to be completely separate from the house mix. And I've got two different instances here that I'm going to show you uh, what we did. So for us, we're a, a duet as we perform, so I've got a keyboard player that I jam with, and then I play guitar and sing, uh, he plays piano and sings. 
I want to be able to have controllable mixes that we can send to each of us. So what I do is any track that we need to be able to control in our in-ear mix, I send to our in-ear monitor mixes. Okay, so in this case, I've got uh, buses set up and I've labeled all of my buses in uh, Logic Preferences. So I'll show you the numbers as well. So this is my wireless in-ear monitors going to bus seven. Okay, so in our tracks, in our live instrument tracks, I have my mix post pan going to bus seven. And then over here, the receiving input of bus seven is actually going to the separate physical output of seven and eight. And then that is now created a, another physical output. So you notice there's stereo here, and then there's output seven and eight, and output nine and 10. These are our two in-ear monitor mixes that are physical hardware outputs on my audio interface. The way that we've got this set up is I actually do a post pan send uh, from my mix. And the reason why is because I want to hear what's going to the house. I'm pretty comfortable uh, playing without being able to hear myself super loud. So I like to hear the actual house mix. For me, when I want to adjust my inner mix, I keep all of these at unity gain and I adjust the main house mix faders so that my inner mix reflects what's going out. And then for my keyboard player, he only needs to hear certain things. He's more comfortable with just a click and the back and track and piano. So I send him a pre-fader mix, and we adjust his mix based on these pre-fader sends that have uh, that are not affected at all by the uh, faders being routed. Um, so additionally, if we want to hear reverb, of course, you send reverb off of the reverb channel strip to the various uh, buses that you want to have. So in this case, we'll send myself some reverb, and we'll send him some reverb. On these, you just do unity gain, and then control the amount of reverb that you want from the initial channel strip. Our final little issue to tackle when it comes to the live audio tracks is, of course, the metronome. Can't forget about that. And so the way we can do this is go to File, Project Settings, Metronome, and then set your output. Uh, you can pick one of your in-ear monitor mixes, and then I'll show you the other steps. So in my case, I'll send it to me on Output 7 and 8. And then um, down here in the mixer, if you're selected to tracks, go ahead and click All and it'll bring up your click track. Now it should be showing that you're now outputting to seven and eight or whatever your physical hardware outputs are. And then you can just send uh, a bus right off of that. Uh, you, you can send it post fader uh, if you like or pre fader, whatever. And then just send it to any and all other hardware outputs for additional band members so that they can hear the click and it's no longer going to the house. And you can do unity gain, um, you can add a gain plugin uh, to the click track channel strip. The next problem to tackle is any software instruments that you have. The audio is covered. So I've got these two uh, software instrument tracks. I've got a grand piano and I've got an alchemy patch that I want my keyboard player in the band to be able to trigger and not have to worry about changing patches on his keyboard. I can just do it from within the sequencer. And that's the whole point, right? So the way that logic works initially is that the sum, a pipe of all incoming MIDI data, gets routed into the sequencer's input so that any active software channel strip will receive incoming MIDI data unless you specifically tell it otherwise. So right now I've got Grand Piano armed and if you listen, it is responding to my MIDI controller. Now watch what happens though, as soon as I click here, I'm gonna now hit my MIDI controller and you'll see it up here at the top, I'm playing an A but nothing is coming out of Grand Piano. So it has to be record enabled. If I wanted both to play, I have to click on both, and then I play and they both sound, but if I were to accidentally during the gig or something happens where I clicked on something else, look at that, Grand Piano went away, Alchemy is still record enabled, but it's not even triggering anymore. So this is a problem. I don't want that to happen during live performance. So we have to do some editing to make this not be a problem. So I'm going to hit screen set three by hitting the number three on my keyboard. And you'll probably see something like this. I don't need another main window. So go up to window and open MIDI environment. Okay. And you can drag it out so that it's full screen. And after you've opened it, you can get rid of that. Uh, so this is now screen set three. So most likely I think it will, I think it opens up to clicks and ports. Now yours probably has a physical input, a keyboard, a monitor, and a sequencer input. You can do everything that you need to do from here, uh, but then you have to deal with the hassle of going back and forth between different layers, and I don't personally like that. So if you want, click, drag, and highlight, 
cut and paste those objects and bring them over to the mixer layer. I like to do them here so that I can see exactly where everything is being routed in one layer. And you can move things around so you actually have this whole space to work with and you can scroll around to use what you need to use. So here's the devices again. We've got physical input, keyboard, monitor, and sequencer input. I'm going to click on the cable going from the monitor to the sequencer input and I'm going to hit control delete. That gets rid of the cable only. It's the keyboard shortcut. If you just hit the delete key, sometimes it'll accidentally delete the object as well, and we don't want that. And then finally, you'll see uh, a routing that should be sum, this very top one, sum into the keyboard. Go ahead and delete that cable. We don't want the sum of all MIDI data going into these channels. I only want the specific thing that I want to happen to go in. So I'm gonna find my Axiom Pro 61 here. It's the second one down. And I'm gonna take that cable and put it into these objects. So now only the Axiom is sending data. And instead of sequencer input, we're gonna route it directly to the channel strip of Grand Piano and then a second one into Alchemy. Now why would we do that? Well, I'll show you. So hit the one key to go back to screen set one. And let's highlight something totally off the wall, live instruments. So Grand Piano is not highlighted, Alchemy, neither are record enabled. But watch what happens when I hit my MIDI controller both of them now sound, regardless of what I have clicked, regardless of what's record enabled, those still always sound. Now what happens if I don't want both layers to sound at the same time? Well, the advantage of this method is we can hit the A key to open up the automation lanes. And now if you look, I've pre-created a couple of automation points to show you the power of this. So I've got the Alchemy Strip muted and I've got the Grand Piano playable. And then you'll notice on bar five, I created a point where the two flip in reverse. So when I hit play, listen to what happens. And you can see, of course, they just switch. So this is a great way to control multiple software instruments uh, and add layers or just use one at a time uh, for different points in the songs that you want to do. And again, they're always triggered no matter what's highlighted and no matter what is record enabled. One other cool thing to consider about this method of using, uh, using the environment to trigger directly to channel strips is possibility of live improvisation. So just as a quick example, let's say that you create an ultra beat track. So instrument plugin, and we'll go down here to ultra beat. Um, we can do the same thing. I can route my drum pads to this ultra beat sequencer and I can actually have it running in pattern mode uh, where I'm triggering with the drum tracks and I can have it in the background with a real-time volume control. So I can bring this in as a layer, I can use it as a drum track. Uh, so if you want, you can pre-program all of your drum beats into this and then just do a single MIDI key along this track to tri trigger your different drum backing tracks if you like, if that's the way that you prefer to work. And then when you're live, it gives you the option to improv a little bit, especially when you're in pattern mode, you can trigger different things on the fly and bring the volume in up and down as you like. So, and there's many, many other applications for this that you can use, uh, so be creative with it. Now there is one major trade-off to this technique that is important to understand. Remember, these are software instrument channel strips. What that means is that they're listening for MIDI inputs instead of audio inputs. Now, by routing, the Axiom's input directly to the channel strip and not to the sequencer input, there is now nothing, no MIDI data actually coming into the sequencer's input to record. So if I were to hit record on the Grand Piano track right now, for example, let me disable that. Grand Piano track and I hit record. Watch what happens as I play the MIDI keyboard. It sounds, but there's absolutely no data being recorded here. That's by design based on this technique, because when we record live, we're not trying to necessarily record MIDI data we're performing. But let's say we do want to record the performance and hear it. MainStage has a function where you can record the main output to hear how your mix actually sounded. So we want to duplicate that in Logic. So I'm going to screen set two where I've got my mixer layer. And what I've done is I've created a bus and I've called it recording output. In my case, I just picked bus 19. That's random. You can pick bus three or one or whatever you want. And then I've routed the output. So now this is where it gets a little tricky. So try to keep the, the routing straight here. So what I've done is everything that is outputting to the house mix 
I am sending to this recording output bus. So think of this as like a, a pre-stereo out. Um, so it's the stereo out mix before it actually goes to the physical outputs. So there's nothing different between bus 19 and the stereo out other than the limiter. And actually you could put the limiter on bus 19 if you really wanted the accurate uh, mix. But either way, this is close enough. So you'll notice what's going on here. The sum of the live tracks are going to bus 19. The individual tracks within the summing stack are still going to the input of the summing stack. So that's important. Don't change the uh, subtracks within the summing stack. And then the software instruments and any backing track that you have created, which I didn't uh, create here, but you'll have a backing track. Those should everything, everything outputting to the house should be going to bus 19. I've even got the reverb bus going to bus 19. So this is truly the, a duplicate of the stereo output. Now, what we do from here is we create a new audio track. So go to create and for input, we're going to actually go down to the bottom here and don't pick a physical input. We're going to pick bus 19, the recording output. So we're going to have this audio track listen to bus 19, the, the stereo output. Uh, there's two options here. If you can really be disciplined and keep track of everything, you can send this to output one and two and then just make sure that you mute it. And the reason why is because as soon as you record enable this track, it's a duplicate, duplicate double signal that's gonna be a little bit louder than what you want. So I either keep that muted or just don't have it outputting to the stereo output at all. All it needs to be doing is listening. So this way when you're performing live and you wanna record your show, and hear what went out to the house so that you can actually get an accurate playback. You just need to record enable the recording output strip. And as you play, you also hit record. And as you can see, um, all outputs will then go to this playback track. Then you can bounce that track down and label it and that will be your stereo master track of that performance. All right, so join me in part two as we cover more about the MIDI environment and ways to make your live performance more streamlined.